Hi, as promised, we're going to take a look at this National Instruments Virtual Bench. Have a play around with it. Now, I've done a teardown video of this thing, and it's beautiful inside. Oh, you got to check it out. Uh, so click here if you haven't seen that. Definitely watch that uh, first. Now, this is a roughly $6,000 US dollar instrument. It's a four-channel, 350 megahertz uh, oscilloscope. That's why you're paying so much. You're paying for the bandwidth. There is a lower model one for this, about $2,000 US dollars two channel only 100 megahertz this is the top of the line 350 megahertz four channel um, arbitrary waveform generator 14 bit all the usual uh, stuff external trigger of course very nice to have the four channels plus the external trigger five and a half digit multimeter should do all your regular stuff uh, five and a half digits is you know, pretty much all you want in uh, this class of instrument. Got a nice DC power supply in it, plus minus 25 volts at uh, one amp. So there's 50 watts and uh, six volts, uh, three amps up to all digitally programmable, quite accurate. Everything else, uh, I believe the specs on your digital multimeter are pretty good too. It's got uh, digital eight channels of digital IO here. And also it's a mixed signal oscilloscope. So you get 16 uh, digital channels for your logic analyzer as well. Uh, one meg sample memory uh, per channel which is not a lot in the scheme of things so I'm quite disappointed uh, by that and it's also somewhat disappointingly for a bench instrument uh, like this like a USB sort of like educational type uh, tool it's only an 8-bit can regular 8-bit converter would have much preferred to see a higher resolution uh, converter in this th side this thing even if you had to sacrifice bandwidth would have been very nice to get like a 12-bit converter you could do some nice uh, DSP stuff combined with the function gen you could do you know bode plot in and really you know decent stuff like that so they haven't done that it's just a regular 8-bit uh digital scope uh it's the hardware in here as we saw in the teardown absolutely you know top-notch hardware in here and in fact it's more capable than the uh specs that this thing's got i don't believe it has intensity uh greater display we'll check out the uh, software and things like that so it's basically a complete lab in one box you've got the mixed signal scope the function generator the multimeter the power supply the digital io you can play around with and all tied into national instruments uh, software i'm pretty sure the software will be pretty decent but that's basically what we're going to test today we're going to plug it in have a play around with the software. So let's actually plug this sucker in. It is uh, Wi-Fi. It's got Wi-Fi uh, connection and also Ethernet and USB as well. So I'm not sure which one we'll use. It'll be a lucky dip. So let's plug it in. And... Don't know if you heard that, but that fan was pretty loud for a couple of seconds. And we've got a little light down there. Ooh, it's blue. Look at that. Um, that uh, fan noise, obviously it's a temperature controlled uh, fan, but uh, that's the power button. It's got, I believe it's got some extra uh, LEDs across here for various uh, status and things like that. But apart from that, it's pretty boring so far. And you get four of the probes with the four channel uh, unit. These are multi-contact uh, brand. You get the uh, regular easy hook. You get the BNC adapter. Always love the BNC adapter. You get the little uh, high frequency uh, ground uh, probe. And well, what's the specs on these things? And these are fixed uh, 10 to one probes, uh, 500 megahertz. So much better than the specs. So yeah, they're spared no expense. Uh, that's why the scope actually does, well, the scope, the unit uh, doesn't uh, have times 10 probe detection. It just assumes that you're gonna use times 10 probes with it, presumably because that's what's supplied. So I hope you can change that in software so you can just feed uh, coax and stuff straight in. And they actually look pretty decent. Look at that. They look fully insulated right around the uh, top there. Very nice. Let's have a look at that. We've got our little high frequency ground adapter there. That's very nice. I like that. Jeez, nicely formed. Brilliant. Better than the little dicky spring ones. And I love the BNC adapters. They're, they're so handy. I use the damn things all the time. And you get a whole bunch of other stuff with it. I love the National Instruments screwdriver. I've had uh, plenty of these kicking around because I've been to lots of National Instruments uh, training courses and seminars and stuff over the years. And uh, I did, they've been giving this away for, I don't know, 20 years now. And I've still got them and they're just incredibly useful. And we have the uh, Phoenix connector for the digital I.O. Very nice. We can get in there. That's why they supply the screwdriver. And it is the correct height. Look at that. Beautiful. 
And I'll tell you what, I'm enjoying the 16-channel Logic Analyzer Pro. That's pretty spiffy. I don't like my chances of opening that. I assume it's got some uh, MSO Logic Analyzer input cable. There it is, 25 volts max. I assume it's got some uh, buffer. Uh, circuitry in there to drive the uh, differential, uh, probably differential uh, drivers to drive the uh, line, and uh, that is really nice quality. Where's my mini grabbers? I swear I can't find the mini grabbers. So they've just given you those. I, what? Come on. And we've got some uh, UL rated uh, Caltest brand. I don't think I've heard of uh, Caltest brand probes before. They're reasonably sharp, very nice uh, silicone leads, very flexible, and oh, they just, yeah, they feel real high quality. Hey, the fan is starting up. I'm not doing anything with it. It started up. I've got a pro plugged in. I've got it hooked into the function gen, but I haven't uh, talked to it or set it up, and that's reasonably annoying that fan don't like it there's a little whine in there and it, it does sound quite whiny um not impressed with that at all and uh imagine if you like if you had a classroom full of these things like 20 30 of them it could get real annoying real quick i'm not sure if you can hear that but the fan is quite like it's it's low enough it just dropped down a little bit further but it's it's whiny and rattly and it just feels really cheap. And I can't imagine what this thing's gonna sound like when it's under like full load, that FPGA in it, that Kintex FPGA is going full pelt and uh, the fan's gotta try and uh, keep up. Uh, if you had a classroom full of these things, 20, 30 of them, could get real annoying real quick. Ah, uh, shame. Because it's otherwise, the hardware is brilliant, but the fan, it's a bit of a fail. And we have ourselves a quick start guide. It's showing uh, to connect it up to the USB port. I believe there's a drive in there with the software installer already installed for the PC. So that is very nice. We shouldn't have to download anything. That's beautiful, assuming it works. By the way, uh, this supports both uh, PC, well, only PC and iPad. There's no support at all for uh, Android tablets. So, uh, I don't have one of those bloody iPad thingies. Now that's attention to detail, check it out. They've actually got one of these uh, locking jacks on the USB cable. Absolutely brilliant. And in a, like in a classroom environment, students uh, throwing these things all around, you don't want your bloody USB cable to come out. These can fall out quite easily. So that is a very nice touch, thumbs up. All right, here we go. Let's give this a bell. I've got the USB cable. It's uh, all the way on the bench over there. I've got it run it like through a, like a five meter USB cable. So let's plug it in. Uh, this is not my main screen. It says, yep, installing device driver, blah, blah, blah. Here it is. And searching, searching. Anyway, it knows what it is. NI Virtual Bench 8034 USB device. And uh, it looks like you have files waiting to be, no, hang on. Files waiting to be burned to disk? Oh, do I? No, I don't. While I'm young. Come on, while I'm young. Anyway, the mass storage device is there, is it? Okay, it's taken a while, but we're getting there. Uh, interface one of three, two of three, three of f uh, four, sorry, and that'll be four of four. And it's actually, uh, uh, it says it's like a CD drive. There it is. That is the actual uh, drive that we got and here's all the software on it awesome virtual bench and that's what it told us run virtual bench launcher so here we go we've installed everything that worked hunky dory i like this so you don't have to download anything you don't have to put in a cd brilliant here we go oh run virtual bench there we go it was going to pop up do you agree to allow and i to periodic periodically collect non-personal usage data no piss off no go away all right, here we go. Allow access. Oh, we're, <laughs> that's it. That's it. We're in like Flynn. Wow, I I expected it to install software or whatever. That 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 is brilliant. That is absolutely brilliant. Huge thumbs up to that. Wow, I've got the one kilohertz uh, signal on the front. It hasn't uh, triggered, but wow.
That's terrific. Beautiful. Okay, the first thing I'm going to do is hit the dreaded auto button, auto setup. I just want to see if it stops, uh, if it actually triggers on the one kilohertz um, signal. So performing auto setup, blah, blah, blah. Yep, there we go. Yep, we're in. Beautiful. And where's our time base? For, oh, phosphor intensity. It does have variable intensity. Display. Brilliant. Okay, we'll test that later, but uh, that's great. Okay, so where's our, here's our time per division. And yeah, okay, it's a USB scope, you know, it, meh, right? Um, but I, I don't, I don't, like, first glance, I don't particularly mind this. Um, here's the function generator over here. So I, <laughs> that's a, like a level indicator for the function generator. That's the output voltage level. Wow, it can go to plus minus 12 volts. That's a big signal range. Um, wonder if it can do that into 50 ohms. Uh, that's interesting. And look, here is up, up here, I've got, look, I don't mind that, how you highlight the, you highlight the uh, digit you want and you go up and down, hey. Oh, I've seen a hell of a lot worse than that. Actually, I I really like that. I really like that. Presumably, you can just uh, type in... Oh, you can type in... Oh, no, hang on. What if I delete everything? One. I can probably just type in one. Oh, look at that. One hertz, one kilohertz, one megahertz. Playing around with the function gen. Haven't even... <laughs> forget the scope um it's just there it's in your face the function gen as well but look everything's here actually uh this is the first time i've used it so you've got the scope of course uh, which is this panel here can we move it can we acquisition no that's uh, no there's all your averages peak detect uh, digital phosphor there it is it does support hence all the hardware that kintex that real kick-ass kintex fpga in there and everything else that's what they're using it for so it's got digital phosphor display very nice okay excellent um it's got peak detect mode seems to be really fast updating too this is really quick updating uh, so they've, I think they've got this right. They're probably only transferring on the USB. They can't transfer all the one meg worth of data. So that's not being continually transferred. I don't know how many times this is updating per second. You know, 20 times, 15, 20 times a second or something. It kind of looks like. Um, it's, it's really quick and uh, responsive. I really like that. That's great. But yeah, it's not, it can't dump the one meg of memory each time so it's obviously it's taking the one meg sample memory but then it's going to be uh just doing the, the display data and then dump it streaming the display data to the uh pc via the usb portal via wi-fi or ethernet or whatever you happen to connect to um but when you stop it when you stop it that's the point where it would um upload the one meg points of memory so if we go like this, if we go way out like that, and we just go um, auto mode, so let's go out like that, and we should be able to, let's have a look at that, let's stop that, okay, and it should give us the one meg capture, and we should be able to zoom in that and see, oh, there we go, well, I don't know, you'd have to do the math on the time base to figure out, um, that might be the limit of our one meg point memory, does it say? Uh, how much uh, memory it's used doesn't say. Is that a bit of a bit of a fail? I'd like to see how much. I assume it's using all the memory all the time. So I would have liked to have uh, seen that actually displayed. Anyway, I this is working great so far. I really like it. Anyway, um, so we've got all these panels. It looks like we can't drag the panels around and like rearrange it. Not that you'd really want to. Uh, what's in the file menu up here? You can import configurations, connect, configure network, blah, 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 blah. Export screenshot, very nice. PNG, please, yes, thank you very much, PNG. Awesome. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, Here's the digital I.O. Look, look, we can just, can we just go down? Oh, oh, digital I.O. in the bottom corner down here. Why can't I just... Set all to, oh, set, oh, set lines to output. Okay, because I haven't actually turned them to outputs. There we go. And I can turn it, the output on or off. Oh, that colours, the green, okay, oh, yeah, all right. 
that's fine. Um, you know, just like, don't use green, put one so that everyone knows it's high, you know, like, yeah. But anyway, that's minor. Um, MSO trigger, that's interesting. So you can actually, um, if you're using all of your 16 channels, you can use some of your external digital I.O. as the MSO trigger and the function generator start as well. That is very flexible. That is very flexible. I like that. I like that. I'm impressed. Okay. And here we go. We can now um, set our voltage and our current limit. So this is our power supply. This is our 6 volts. So it'll, like a bigger font, please. Like that tiny little 6 volt font there. Anyway, that's really quite nice. If we, So if we just highlight that and go, I want 5 volts, please. Thank you very much. Bob's your uncle. Very nice. And then your plus minus uh, 25 volts here. You can actually turn the output off or on. There it is. Now it's live reading. So this is your set voltage, your set current, and your read voltage and current, one millivolt resolution, one milliamp resolution. This is, this is great. You, you're certainly getting your money's worth. This looks very nice. Constant voltage mode. It'll tell you when it switches over in constant current mode. If we just go short of the output and go into constant current. Um, here is our, we're on the 100 millivolt range. Our, sorry, I'll just drag this over here like this and uh, we're now on our digital multimeter uh, panel down here volts DC volts AC would, like the fonts are a bit small I would have uh, liked them to be uh, larger than that but anyway um, and then continuity range and no nah, it's fixed okay but uh, yeah we go down to 100 millivolt range one microvolt resolution everything's hunky-dory I like this thing I like it. They've done it really well, but that's what you'd expect. You'd expect national instruments to produce, you know, competent, um, you know, useful software. It's exactly what you expect. All right, I got the scope plugged into the function generator. Let's check out the uh, function gen itself. I got it set to one volt uh, peak to peak, and here's the signals we can choose: sine, square triangle this is all very uh, 1970s and uh, DC level as well but we can also choose arbitrary waveform which is wonderful um, but uh, if we go in here and browse um, yeah browse what browse the oh, the CD drive why does it keep moving like where it's looking for a text or a CSV file where are the files? Where are the built-in waveforms? Everyone wants, expects built-in waveforms to an arbitrary function generator, especially in an educational lab environment. That's a huge oversight. That's crazy. Why can't they provide that? Maybe they're in here. They wouldn't be in licensing. and wouldn't be in documentation. These are just different languages, right? I mean, come on. There's just nothing. There's nothing there. That's a huge huge fail massive fail well let's go back to our sine wave shall we? we've got our one megahertz sine wave but can we do anything else with it can we modulate it no we can change the dc offset um it looks like we can change the duty cycle of the yeah that's no worries at all okay great but this is, this is rudimentary functionality i'm very disappointed by that especially for an educational tool of this uh, price level. Nuts. And well, here we go. I've used a uh, external function generator to do my uh, standard one megahertz uh, carrier with a one kilohertz uh, AM modulation with a uh, hundred percent uh, modulation and um, the, the triggering is very typical of most uh, scopes. So that jittering is, you know, that's that's fairly normal. Don't don't worry about that at all. Um, but what we're looking at is the uh, intensity graded display, and it's there. You know, it's actually doing a half reasonable job. But um, yeah, that's okay. It gets a pass. But will it alias? That is the question. Let's have a squiz. No, it's doing, it's doing pretty all right. Yep. Excellent. No aliasing on that. Many uh. Better scopes have uh, failed that one. That's great. Thumbs up.
And some of you might be thinking, Dave, what's up with the uh, fuzziness of this line? Is this scope? noisy in quote marks uh no i've done a whole video on that and that is uh very normal for a high bandwidth scope like this high bandwidth scopes are inherently noisy and high bandwidth and high update rate scopes are even noisier again because they're actually capturing the real stuff that's there low end scopes appear less noisy because they're um they're just not fast enough to uh actually display it so that's no problems whatsoever. Um, maybe if we can turn some uh, averaging on, we might uh, get that. So let's have a play around with the input here. Here we go. We can have our AC or DC coupling. There we go. We can do the times one uh, times 10 probe attenuation there. And if we do the 20 megahertz bandwidth, maybe we'll see it clean up a bit. There we go. Um, and also because it's only an 8-bit sampling converter, 256 levels, I'm doing a 1920 by 1080 screen capture here. So obviously it's got to do some pixel doubling, you know, interpolation, all that sort of stuff. Um, you can set the uh, input impedance to um, 50 ohms. Excellent. Selectable. Nice. Now let's check out the triggering here on the menu. What do we got? Edge, pattern, pulse width, pretty basic. Uh, nothing fancy pantsy there at all. You can trigger from any of the digital uh, channels, all the digital I.O. channels, the trigger B and C, the uh, line frequency or the function gen start. Very nice. That's actually quite flexible in terms of uh, sources. Rising, falling, either. You've got to have the either. Um, and uh, noise reject. There we go. That's but that's um, that's pretty basic. It'll do all the things. This looks like, ta-da! We can pop out these panels. These are good, so you can just leave them anywhere. If you're using these all the time, they don't snap into place anywhere. Um, but you know, if you're using them all the time, just yeah, break out the panels and leave them there. Nice. And by the way, you can just uh, move the waveform up and down. Just grab it and drag it, or you know, you can do the. Uh, thing on the side there there's no button to center it but uh, that's uh, neither here nor there and the trigger level you can just set like that i like it how it uh, shows the level as you hold it and drag it and if it's off the screen like this it actually puts it right up there like that so you can just drag it back down so a trigger and uh, waveform um, movement works just hunky dory now if we go up here we've got our acquisition stuff it's not immediately obvious you know i'd like to see like an acquisition button or something like that but eh, you know whatever it's got peak detect mode awesome um yeah well there we go hey i expected a bit more noise on the peak detect mode there what's going on anyway digital phosphor okay acquisition and here's our averaging and there we go we'll see it go to a nice thin line um because it's averaging out the noise there no wackers um it doesn't have any um high resolution mode at all there's no high resolution mode why i w would have expected that on a uh, scope like this or is that all right that's a uh, sampling mode okay so it's not real time mode it's um uh equivalent time uh sampling that's what's uh, going on there but that's really i i expected more functionality for the money i really did anyway we've got uh we can do persistence no worries at all so if we go off the screen off the trigger yep our persistence shows up it resets the persistence when you move the trigger like that okay some scopes uh clear it some scopes don't depends on your preference um and what else we've got we've got clear display and we've got pin out which we've uh, seen before that's fine and dandy um but yeah i no high resolution mode uh quite quite disappointed no um yeah no uh box car averaging on the thing mm, thumbs down well let's go into more we always want more let's check it out i like They've got tons of room here. Why does it have to be more? Look at all this unused room here. Why bother having more? Why not just put FFT there? I, I, like it, and, and the reference wave, for, like math and FFT. Why not just put them there? That's just dumb. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, they got 90% with the user interface and then gave up. Um, store from the analog uh, channel so we can actually store... The data we can capture, we can load from files. Okay, so what what does it uh, expect? 
when we uh, load that. It's expecting a VB reference file. So it's obviously some custom uh, file, some custom jobby. Anyway, uh, the math functions, let's check out the math functions. Where are they? Where are they? Here we go. Here we go. Now, see, it showed up like, why not just keep the math there? I mean, I, I don't get it. All right, so if we go in there, we can actually change it. There we go, plus, minus, multiply, divide, all the usual stuff. Nothing fancier than that. There's no integration. Um, once again, for a educational tool, um, especially one of this uh, price point, I would have expected all of the math functions, like even the Rigol DS1054Z, right? 400 buck bench scope um, it can do, you know, a ton more than this. That's just... Nah, that's, that is not good enough. That is not good enough. They need to work on their math. Yep, not happy with it. You've got to drag both at once. You can't drag one. Oh, yeah, you can drag one individually. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. So drag on the screen drags everything. That's kind of handy. And then if you want to drag one, it's over here. But too bad if it's behind it. You've got to drag that one first and then that one. It depends on which one you're focused on. Yeah, anyway. All right. So math is um, barely what's there. That's about all I can give it. Um, and our FFT is uh, presumably, um, it's not done in hardware on the uh, virtual bench. It's done in the uh, software here. So let's, uh, we can break that panel out, actually. There we go. There we go. So let's uh, move our FFT like that. Frequency per division. Dot. There we go. And we're going to be very coarse. Actually, let's uh, put the square wave in. There we go. It's very coarse, of course. Um, the uh, frequency resolution just isn't there. The bin-in resolution isn't there because we've only got a couple of cycles on the screen. So that's absolutely useless. So let's go and uh, fix that. And you'll notice that our resolution gets better and better and better. Let me... Uh, There we go. There we go. Gets better and better and better. So I'll show you that getting worse now. Here we go. See? Until it's practically unusable. If you've only got a single cycle, that's a uh, trap for young players. Students learn that very quickly. That's the advantage of, well, it's not just the, uh, any scope you can do this on. Um, you, you, know, you play off the time base, they think, oh, okay, I've got my square wave on the screen. Let's see what the frequency components are. And then, wah, you get this ridiculous looking, um, you know, uh, spectrum like this, which doesn't look anything like the lecturer said or what the textbook shows. Um, and even this looks like, you know, some dick and balls. Um, it, it's hopeless. Yeah, you've got to get more samples, data. The algorithms don't work without data. All right, they got all the usual window culprits down here. Oh, regular and advanced. Oh, seven-term Blackman Harris for you Blackman Harris fanboys out there. Exact Blackman. Well, you don't want this seven-term rubbish. You want to be exact. <laughs> anyway, um, low side load. There you go. Look at that. Um, where it's all, hey, that that's reasonable. But the FFT functionality, eh, you know pretty basic you know we can do some um, vertical offset and uh, stuff like that but um, yeah I mean volts per division 20 uh, does it well that's the other thing where's the scale where's the scale look there should where's the y vertical scale that's just ridiculous we need okay it's over here but if you didn't have that panel open right if, if you had this panel closed, oh no, there we go, 20 dB uh, volts. Okay, I, I don't know. It would have been nice to scale it over here. Look at all that unused space on the screen there. It it would have been nice. Anyway, um, well, cursors down here. Here we go. We can um, uh, time. Uh, oh, hang on. Channel one. Ah, there we go. We can choose the FFT. Okay, it's going to change. All right, there we go cursor one but it doesn't looks like you can't just like skip to the peaks and things like that there's no auto peak detection it would have been nice if you know it detected all these frequency peaks and had a button down there here that said you know enable peaks at some threshold value and you know auto detect peaks and things like that but 
Um, no, nothing. Once again, you know, rudimentary scopes, uh, rudimentary scope FFT functions have better functionality than this, and they cost a lot less. So, you know, yeah, I think there's still uh, like I like the software. The software is quite good in terms of you, uh, you know, USB scopes I've seen. It's really quite good, but it, it's just it's not good enough. I expect more, especially for the price. And if we go to the digital stuff down here, we can choose buses. We've got I squared C, parallel, and SPI. Um, where is like RS two thirty two? Where's serial? That's disappointing. Um, so yeah, there's our uh, line. So we can choose what's that en enabled? Okay, so there we go. We're turning those on here. Presumably we can uh, drag. Yeah, we can drag those. It automatically rearranges. That's good. Uh, it's doing all the regular stuff. Um, our maximum sampling rate is uh, one gig sample per second on the digital lines. And we can set our threshold voltage. It's all adjustable, so it uh, doesn't matter what uh, logic family you're using. And that maximum digital buffer size, one million transitions. There you go. So that's it. Um, so it must have sample compression because it's doing... Uh, it, it enables you to select transitions instead of meg samples it's got the sampling rate and instead of setting a memory depth size it's giving you you know x number you know 10,000 transitions a million transitions or whatever so it's obviously doing sample compression and that's very nice i'm not sure you'd have to check the spec sheet to know exactly how much sample memory it actually does have but uh that's nice it, it means that when you have a uh you have packets of data that are spread you know by long period long dead periods you're not wasting all your sample memory taking all those dead periods you only it's only the transitions that are stored in memory time stamped and did it transition higher did it trans uh, transition low and then that makes more effective use of your memory but you still need a lot of sample memory um you know the uh sampling compression like this is not magic um you've got to have a lot of memory to back it up of course because if one if you've got a thousand transitions in one packet and you want to measure 10 packets and you've only got, you know, 1K of uh, sample memory, then it can only do a 1,000 transitions. You're going to miss these other packets. So, yeah. Um, but I'm sure it does. I think it's got, like, megs or something worth of memory. And I just found a limitation with the uh, bus trigger. And if we go into digital here, I'm trying to set it up, like set up my SDA line. We can choose any one of the 16 digital channels. We can choose the digital I.O., um, but we can't choose the analog inputs and that's what i was using Wah. and here we go check this out i'll go in auto mode here we go we're now doing uh real time i squared c uh decoding i've basically uh got the same signal i've got data on uh channel one and uh, clock on channel two here and same with d0 and d1 there so they're actually back to front like that so if we actually single shot capture that we should be able to oh actually sorry i got that uh Got that back to front. There we go. We should be able to uh, capture that like that. And if we zoom in, we can see, oh, that's not a good example. But uh, let's single shot capture that again. There we go. Look at that. There we go. There's a whole I squared C packet. Very nice. Seems to have done the business. What's happening with that little, that pulse there? Oh, I don't know. Um, I'm using a uh, Tektronix uh, demo board here, by the way. So I have no idea what uh signals is actually generated may actually deliberately be in putting in a false pulse there perhaps huh. but that's the advantage of having your um uh your being able to view your waveform as well um so yeah it's a bit disappointing that you can't actually trigger off the uh analog signal channels because that's handy you know to be able to view your signal to make sure your signal integrity is fine but check out the rise time on that that is poor as and uh but hey we're getting data out of it and it seems fairly quick and it seems to be doing seems to be doing the business anyway and we've got just got some uh you know line termination um probing type issues here but no big deal but it seems to be seems to be doing it and I'm not sure if we can actually set the height on those digital channels. It'd be nice to actually uh, expand those. I don't think you can. Like if you're only got like you know, two channels like this, actually expand the things. And the other thing, 
Um, that's a bit disappointing. Is I can I like the fact that they snap into place and then automatically move around. That's fine and dandy. But if you want to overlay that, now you can see that the Titan, that the digital and the analog are correlated there. Okay, that's fine and dandy. But you can't leave it there. It just snaps back, and you'll notice that this is correlated down here as well. So that's obviously you can see that um, pulse in here, that one that didn't go all the way up. You but you saw anyway. It just didn't have the rise time actually. That's yeah that's what it is we've just got a rise time issue on the i squared c lines the um the pull up resistor value is not uh, high enough so yeah it's just not doing the business there but anyway it's still detecting that because that will depend on our threshold value which we can change um so let's actually give that a go i just noticed that the threshold maximum th digital threshold can only go to two volts huh what the? And it hasn't got like an upper and lower um, threshold. So I don't know what's going on there. Um, that's quite disappointing. Anyway. Huh. Yeah. There we go. Did we get it? Yeah, we still got it. We still got it. And of course we can change that to uh, binary there for you binary aficionados. None of that hex rubbish. But unfortunately, um, I can't see any way up here to trigger off the like a uh, pattern or anything like that so there's nothing hardware they've got all that hardware sitting in there they've got that uh, uh zinc uh fpga plus the kintex fpga um a huge beast and they can't they haven't implemented uh you know i squared c and, and spi uh pattern uh triggering for example so um it's it's quite limited. You've got to go in there and like decode it. So you can't, you know, trigger on missing acknowledges and, you know, all that sort of jazz. So it's not really a uh, protocol, um, you know, analyzer as such. So there we go. You know, it's got, it's with the one meg sample memory, we can capture like the entire group of data here and then we can uh, zoom in. So that's okay. Um, but that's standard on a deep ish memory scope like this one with one meg. But yeah, you can't trigger, unfortunately on anything so you can't you know like a data word or something like that which is very useful for uh debugging and things like that but considering i guess this is primarily targeted at the educational market i think you know it okay but still yeah it would have been nice to have that sort of stuff so this is not a real this is you know, not a real tool for real world uh you know advanced troubleshooting and uh, things like that, certainly on um, I squared, you know, serial buses and the like. Um, you can view them, you can capture them, but eh, the rest is up to you. And the other thing that I uh, realized it's not here that I would have liked to see is some sort of uh, automated, you know, programmable control over the digital I.O. down in the bottom corner here. But we can set them to inputs, set them to outputs, but we can't sequence them you know you can't like put a counter on there for example you know basic sort of you know educational training stuff like that um you just can't do it so uh, like yeah that would have been nice but granted all this national instruments hardware is fully configurable with either lab view or lab windows cvi which is which is what i've used in the past for doing lots of uh national instruments based test systems uh the lab windows cvi stuff is uh, quite nice and you can you know they've got the libraries for all this and i'm sure I have absolutely no doubt whatsoever even though i'm not going to test it today it requires too much uh time and effort but you can actually, uh, they have all the libraries that you can program it using LabVIEW, LabWindows, whatever uh, tool floats your boat. And uh, yeah, it'll all work. That's the advantage of National Instruments is that everything's integrated with all their tools and things like that, all their programming environments. So yeah, you can do that. But in the app here, nah, it's just, it's pretty basic. And I will not uh, play with this today, but there's a networking option up here because it's just going to work the same. I'm, you know, and I don't have an iPad, so I can't test the iPad app. Um, but we can create a new wireless uh, network here and we can uh, disable, right? So we can create a new wireless network and set it all up and everything, you know, and we can play around with the Ethernet as well and hook it up either way. But it works excellent via USB. No problems at all. It's, <laughs> in fact, as we saw at the start, it's fantastic with USB. You just plug it in, it's a drive, the software's on there, you just run it, boom, no software installation on your machine. Oh, it's beautiful. 
Why can't everyone do that for a USB scope? I don't know. And again, another disappointing aspect of this thing is the digital multimeter down here. I, like, it's going to have good specs. I don't, like, it probably won't even insult National Instruments uh, reputation by, you know, hooking up, uh, you know, my reference generators to this and playing with it. It looks like it's, like, fast updating five and a half digit meter, but what can you do with it? It's just a multimeter. Where's, like, trend plotting and stuff like that? Like... You know, I, it, it's just not there. It's begging for it. It's absolutely begging to have a logging multimeter there to get uh, trend plots and stuff. And it's just not there. Other stuff that is missing uh, from here. Did I mention it before? I don't know. This has been far too long. But uh, where are the Bode plots, for example? No, not Bode. Bode. That's how we pronounce it here. Um, and, like, where's, where's the Bode plot? Like, classic training stuff like that. It's got the function generator. It's got the uh, DSO. It's got the uh, multimeter. It's got the... Everything's built in, right? But you can't log stuff. You can't do things like that. You can't get Bode plots. Like, where, how can we sweep the function generator? We can't sweep it. We can't modulate it. We can't do anything. Like, it's just really rudimentary stuff. And this is a six grand instrument. So I would have, you know, expected the software to have all the bells and whistles like that. You know, you can go buy your, you know, your analog discovery uh, thing for what is 150 bucks or 200 bucks or whatever it is. I think it's under 100 bucks educational price. And it does those sorts of things. You know, it, it, it. And this thing doesn't do it. So, yeah, disappointed. Thumbs down, um, National Instruments, in terms of advanced functionality like that. But it gets a thumbs up in terms of basic functionality and implementation. But that's all it is, is a basic implementation of stuff. And it's disappointing. Like the power supply, for example. We can't sequence the power supply. Where is the sequencing stuff? Tracking. Oh, we can set uh, tracking the positive and negative. But that's it, right? Um, like that, that's begging out the programming, the power supply is begging out to be programmable. Where's the programmable functionality? Like I said, you can code this stuff yourself using whatever national instruments tool you like, but that's beside the point, right? A uh, instrument of this price and grade and educational focus should have all this sort of, you know, programmable functionality built in. So yeah, disappointed. Quite disappointed. Oh, all right, there it is. I've hooked up my uh, multi-thousand dollar 10K precision resistor, and it's bang on. And I'll tell you what else uh, would have been nice on this thing as well. Would have been nice to maybe have a uh, K-type thermocouple uh, probe on this thing as part of the uh, multimeter, or maybe they could have like a Tate and K-type connector on the uh, front panel so you can hook up the, you know, regular temperature probes, maybe two channels, that would have been really nice, wouldn't it? Um, that would have added a huge amount, wouldn't have added anything in the scheme of things to the uh, cost of the hardware, but they, you know, they didn't add that, and they could have done, you know, you could have um, done, you know, sequencing of your power supply with uh, logging with your digital multimeter, logging the temperature as well, while capturing scope signals, and this could have been a ridiculously powerful uh, debugging tool that everyone would have used. Everyone, you know, if it had all that advanced functionality and the, uh, and like the, the 350 megahertz version we're looking at here is quite expensive, but the, uh, 100 megahertz dual channel ones, not, you know, out of bounds, uh, for, you know, your hobbyist or your professional or something like that. Um, and if it had all that advanced functionality, then, you know, maybe it, it would have been a lot more uh, tempting for the individual to uh, buy this thing. But, nah, nah, it's just got basic functionality. Mm. <laughs> All right, I'm going to try out some, uh, just some loads here on um, the plus 25 volt channel. I've just got my uh, DC electronic uh, load here, my BK Precision uh, load, and I've got it set for uh, 22 uh, watts and uh, which is constant power load and it doesn't start up it does not start up with that whereas if I go switch it hang on there we go there we go I just went to uh, switch that and you'll notice that it came good but if I uh, turn that power off and on again it won't uh, restart so I can't quite do the um, 25 volts uh, one amp 
that it uh, claims on there. So there must be power, you know, there's some uh, power envelope uh, thing. I'm not sure if they have that in the uh, manual or not. I don't think it's that, the specs of that uh, detailed. I don't remember, recall seeing any uh, uh, power response graphs. So I'm just drawing a couple of watts from uh, the second uh, channel here and you know it's going to be very it's got it's got excellent specs on the power supply and uh, you know it read back reads back directly from the terminal so everything's uh, hunky dory so but yeah it can't quite deliver what it claims that's all but no big deal so there you have it that's a look at the uh, 350 megahertz national instruments virtual bench thank you very much national instruments for uh, loaning this mine so we can have a play around with it and um you probably already know my opinion of this thing. It's competent in what it does. The software is competent. There's no bugs. It's fast. It, it has all the basic functionality. But I can't help but be quite disappointed. I'm very disappointed, especially at the price point for this 350 megahertz one that doesn't have more programmable capability. The R gen, you know, like basic stuff, power supply sequencing, multimeter logging. Things like that. Why can't I do these uh, sorts of things? It, I, you know, it, granted, it's software. They can add it, and I hope they uh, take um, this on board and things like that and uh, uh, actually improve the software because they can improve it. They can add stuff to the FPGAs and things like that. Um, or I'm not sure how they'd update them, but I'm sure they'd uh, update the FPGAs in there, but I'm sure they've thought of that. Uh, maybe you should be able to maybe get a tool to do that. And... Yeah, it really is some serious uh, hardware at a serious price, and the software is competent, but very quite basic. Um, but much better than most USB oscilloscope uh, software I've used is just crap. But as I said, there's some other good ones out there, like the um, uh, analog discovery and things like that, that do have a lot more functionality in there for a lot less uh, price. But this um, it does exactly what they wanted it to do, which would be for the uh, all-in-one education market. But in so this is not really something that the individual would go out and buy necessarily. It's a very niche market for that. If you need the compact form factor, I love that everything is all in the one unit. That's fantastic. I can uh, think of many times in the past where I would have killed to have a, such a small form factor thing from National Instruments. I've had to use multiple National Instruments cards in like uh, production test systems and things like that to automate all sorts of stuff. I would have loved, or automate even bench top uh, systems, not necessarily uh, production uh, to all their production test systems, but they're like on benches. And just to have one little box that does it all is brilliant. And I've had to have like a racks, 19 inch racks full of all the different individual gear to actually do stuff like this. And um, to have it all in the one box is, is really quite neat. And the hardware quality and design is first rate. So you're definitely uh, no issues there at all. You're getting your money's worth. Um, and the software is competent, but very basic. I just wish it was better. And I think that they could actually have a, quite a reasonable uh, bigger market out there for the thing if the software did more stuff um, in terms of uh, login and automation and uh, stuff like that. I know it's all programmable, but you know, out of the box, I would have liked to see it do a lot more. I thought of, as I said, described like half a dozen dis different things that I was disappointed that the software didn't have. And I kind of you know, expected it to have those sorts of things, at least half a dozen. Uh, I could, you know, if I sat here and thought about it, probably, a, you know, a dozen improvements I could make to the software to do that. But anyway, so that's, yeah, it's a nice bit of instrument. Gets a thumbs up. But yeah, it's not something that you'd go out and buy. Like for a 350, you're paying for the bandwidth here. For 350 megahertz, um, there's much better value out there in benchtop scopes and things like that. Not... You know, then they're not. This is not double the price of a 350 megahertz um, scope, or so. Or it might be. Depends. You know, the retail price might be like a 350 meg Rigo. Oh, no, they're about four grand, something like that. This is about six thousand. So, you know, um, maybe the Siglent ones are a bit cheaper. But it, it's a different instrument for a different market. But it's all in one. The power supply, the, the digital I/O, the function gen. I just yeah. And I haven't tried out the, uh, you know, the iPad app and things like that. So, you know, in theory, you could sit this on your bench and have your 
iPad uh, tablet just there, and it's actually an incredibly small form factor uh, thing. You know, we could have a notebook or something like that, wireless connection, all that sort of jazz. And, you know, it, it could be very good, but yeah, there's more powerful benchtop oscilloscopes out there. And, you know, if you're after a general purpose instrument, you wouldn't be buying this thing. You'd get a general purpose bench scope or something like that with maybe a USB logic analyzer uh, added on for, um, you know, uh, just for logic analyzer and protocol analysis because the protocol analysis is very rudimentary on this thing and you can't trigger off stuff and search. You know, we haven't even gotten into all that uh, sort of jazz of the logic analyzer uh, functionality in the thing. It doesn't have any of that. So, you know, yeah, you wouldn't, your average professional would not be buying this as their everyday uh, tool. But uh, for the education market, yeah, it's quite neat. You can, you know, hand a tablet around the classroom, you know, people can play with it, it can be hooked up to all sorts of stuff and they can, you know, interact with it and play and it's really quite neat. But if you do have that niche need for an all-in-one instrument, especially one that's programmable using LabVIEW or LabWindows CPI, CVI or any other uh, programming uh, uh, system, then, you know, to automate stuff and things like that, this could be the bomb. Uh, real small form factor. And, and, you know, people might complain about the price, but, you know, from big companies that I've uh, came from, it's nothing to spend 20, 30 grand on a, on a 19 inch rack full of, you know, rack mount PC uh, to automate stuff. And then all the separate instruments costing five, 10 grand a pop. You know, it's not, it is not, uh, you know, unreasonably priced in, in that respect. It's just a different market to what, you know, a hobbyist or a, you know, a low end professional might be uh, used to. Uh, when you're, you know, spending your own money, uh, it's uh, quite a lot different. But for companies and educational institutions who would be getting a hefty discount on this thing, I'm sure when they buy them in, you know, 20, 30, you know, a couple of classroom or two at a time worth, you know, uh, then they'd be getting substantial discounts. But yeah, um, it has its market. So don't complain about the price. It is what it is. And I think it offers, you know, quite reasonable uh, value for money if you're in, you know, integrated all in one. I don't know another. Is there another one that's as heavily integrated as this one? I'm not sure. I don't think there is. You know, there's a couple of like the bare boards, like the analog discovery and things like that, which are just like, they're not professional like, you know, bench level instruments like, uh, like this one is. So yeah, um, it is what it is and I like it. It's very nice. It worked out of the box. I've had no bugs, no crashes, and it was all seamless and it's great. I like it. So that's it. I hope you enjoyed that not, uh, brief at all. Look at the new National Instruments Virtual Bench. Catch you next time. Hi. There's a lot of people who've wanted me to take a look at this for quite a long time and play to your heart's content with this thing all at 14-bit resolution up to basically uh, 10 megahertz bandwidth. Fantastic. But hey, in my book, being able to get this uh, bode plot, this transfer function over frequency with 14-bit resolution up to 10 megahertz, that alone is worth the price of entry on this tool. Um, you know, even at the full uh, 270 bucks, that's, you know, it's really quite decent.